and recording. All right. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I know people are going to be trickling in over the next minute or so coming from the previous session. So as we are all entering the room, I want to say thank you so much for joining us on the first day of <clears throat> iAssist. This is the longest day because we figured the first day everyone had the most energy. So we are very excited that you are sticking with us, especially if you are in a time zone where it's getting kind of late, or if you are our Australian or New Zealand colleagues, this is finally not an unrealistically early hour. So we are very excited that you can join us. So we are gonna have three fantastic talks in this session, but before we get started, a few logistics, which you are probably used to from the other sessions. So please put your questions as you have them for the panelists into the Zoom Q&A. So again, the Q&A from within the Zoom webinar. Um, you can use the chat for kind of non-directed questions. And again, if you have any technical problems, you can um, send a message to myself or San in the chat and we will make sure that everything is working fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first presenter. Um, so our first presenter is Linda Lowry. So Linda has been the business and economics librarian at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada since 1997. She holds a Master of Library Science from the University of Toronto, a Master of Arts in Communication and Technology from the University of Alberta, and a Master of Business Administration from Niagara University. She has been a member of ISS for many years, which we're very thankful for, <laughs> and business data continues to be both a thorn in her side and a motivation for scholarly research. So this is going to be her third presentation about business data as, at an ISS conference, and we are really excited to learn more. So, um, Linda, you have the floor. All right. Now, this is where I, you see if I actually can share my screen. So, there we go. And success. Success. Awesome. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk, Scaling Up Research, Research Data Services, a Saga of Organizational Design Gone Awry. Academic institutions may initiate organizational redesign in order to better pursue new strategic priorities. In the case of Brock University Library, one of these priorities was active engagement throughout the research life cycle. The draft organizational design framework proposed the creation of a new unit that would take a holistic life cycle, life cycle approach to research, encompassing activities related to research processes and the stewardship of research output. Unfortunately, it also called for the elimination of the current liaison structure. The eight subject librarians would be redeployed to functional roles in other departments. No one was more shocked at this turn of events than me, because in my role as the business and economics liaison librarian, I knew how crucial it was to understand the disciplinary landscape with respect to research practices in order to develop research data services that aligned with researcher needs. I wondered, would the new organizational structure be able to meet the discipline specific needs of business and economics researchers for data reference, data literacy, and data retrieval assistance? Or would this become a saga of organizational design gone awry? I'll present a brief overview of the organizational design process and where research data services will sit in the new structure. I'll follow with insights into the discipline specific data needs of business and economics researchers derived from a thesis content analysis and a review of librarian consultation statistics. And finally, I'll conclude with just a few recommendations. Brock University is a public comprehensive university located in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada with a wide variety of academic programs, including master's level research degrees in management and business economics. There are 20 librarians and about 30 library staff. 
The draft organizational framework was unveiled in late 2019. Details of the new functional units, including the research life cycle and a new liaison teams proposal were fleshed out during internal consultations. Our data librarian took early retirement in December 2020 and the new GIS data librarian won't start until June 2021. As of May 17th, all stakeholder consultations have been completed and the librarians who are going to be redeployed should be notified soon, myself included. Based in the new research lifecycle department, the GIS and data services librarian will provide a full range of GIS and data services, including consultations, instruction and outreach in the discovery and use of secondary data sources across a range of disciplines. In the new disciplinary teams model, the library will move from having individual librarians assigned to specific programs uh, to a team-based model where Brock's University's six academic faculties in pairs as indicated on my slide will be assigned to a team of three librarians drawn from the teaching and learning research life cycle and collection services departments. Now moving on to the evidence. Theses content analysis is a proven discovery method for gaining insight into disciplinary data needs and practices. In 2015, I explored primary and secondary data use by business graduate students based on a quantitative content analysis of a corpus of 32 management theses. In 2021, I used the same approach to analyze a new corpus of 57 theses completed in the same program from 2014 until 2020. Uh, summary of my 2015 findings, over 70% of these researchers could be categorized as business data consumers for whom the discovery and acquisition of secondary data, most often from subscription-based financial and accounting data sources were crucial real world activities. Less than 30% were business data producers collecting only primary data. Now the results from the latest study. Finance is still the largest area of specialization, comprising 42% of theses, down from 47% in the first study. The distribution of theses across the other uh, subject specializations has even out a little bit more since the first uh, study. 67% of the theses I analyzed collected only secondary data, while 30% collected only primary data. So these results are comparable to the earlier cohort with a similar 70-30 split. The finance uh, specialization relied exclusively on secondary data sources, as did the majority of theses in accounting and in the operations and information system specialization. This too mirrors the findings from my first study. Secondary data collectors used both open and proprietary data sources. Secondary data collectors, um, oh, secondary data collectors, uh, use of open sources, sorry, my notes are messed up. Use of open sources uh, doubled from the previous um, analysis from 8.6 to 17.5% of secondary data sources. So what are the top sources? Five of the most frequently used commercial data sources were subscription-based financial market data sets, um, the usual suspects, um, data sets um, in the words platform like CompuStat, CRISP, and ExecuComp, uh, data from Bloomberg terminals, and of course our friends uh, at Refinitiv with DataStream. Now on to the second set of evidence, uh, liaison statistics. Brock's librarians, including our data librarian, record our research consultation activity in a simple shared database. I analyze these statistics for the 2019 and 2020 calendar years to gain insight into the nature of data related consultations. 
a frequency analysis of consultations by topic across all disciplines reveals that around 17 percent or about 120 consultations per year involve the topic of statistics and data searching. So I'm going to drill into those um, specific consultations next. Close to half of all data consultations came from users in the business school, followed by 31% from users in the social sciences. Oh, sorry, this is the patron type one. Uh, these consultations were fairly uh, evenly distributed by patron type, 36 coming from faculty, uh, 32 from grad students, and 23 from undergraduates. Now by, by subject. So close to half were from business and about a third from the social sciences. So who answers data questions? My analysis revealed that in my capacity as the business and economics librarian, I recorded 68 of the data consultations in our uh, statistics database. Well, our data librarian, who also had some liaison areas, recorded 26% of the interactions. So this speaks to the data intensive nature of business and economics consultation activity, as well as to the potential volume of questions which may be referred to the data librarian after the reorganization. Now, uh, drilling down into the uh, courses and programs within the business school, I used a Voyant tool Cirrus word cloud uh, feature to visualize the top terms noted in our optional field for course and program. So not surprisingly, accounting, finance, uh, investment courses top this list, but entrepreneurship and marketing also occurred frequently in this notes field. Under comments, the top 25 terms reveal that access to data uh, tops, tops concerns. Um, as the words librarian representative, um, I have the ability to approve account requests, so words is up there as well. Um, also during our, the pandemic, there was a lot of confusion about how to access um, sources like Bloomberg terminals or data stream, which was limited to on campus. So I was fielding a lot of those questions as well. Um, people were looking for industry information, market, company, and financial data are also on my top 10 list. What about the social sciences? Uh, economics was a primary driver of social science data consults, including course related consults for uh, Econ 5P04, which is taken by students in our Master's in Business Economics program, and Econ 3P10, which is the research methods course for undergrad majors, where students have to collect data for regression analysis assignments. Other programs such as political science, geography, and labor studies also had data consults. In the comments area, uh, you can see that a lot of users were looking for Canadian data from Statistics Canada, surveys, census data, public use microdata files, or help with uh, data repositories. In Ontario, we have something called Odyssey, as well as the uh, Wharton Research Data Service. Uh, so some observations. Organizations offering research data services should be aware that certain areas of business and management research such as economics, financial and accounting research, each have their own traditions and approaches. As this quote from a standard business research methods, research methods textbook notes. Data discovery, particularly of library licensed data resources is a common struggle for economics, undergraduate and graduate students as documented in several recent studies. Ithaca SR's report on teaching business also noted that significant barriers exist for both instructors and students in finding and accessing data, and especially industry and financial data. And finally, secondary data reference work can also be difficult and frustrating for librarians, in part due to non-standardized discovery environments. So how can we keep this from all going awry? Um, I have three recommendations. One, integrate discipline specific data literacy into teaching and learning initiatives by providing guidance and support 
geared to class assignments in economics, entrepreneurship, marketing, and finance. Two, integrate discipline specific content and support into research lifecycle initiatives, including support for those key commercial data sources like Bloomberg Data Stream and the Wharton Research Data Service. And three, create a business and economics data collection development policy, which we don't have right now, um, after consultation with disciplinary faculty in those key departments, accounting, finance, the business economics program, and other subfields that rely heavily on commercial secondary sources to do their research. And that wraps up my talk. Thank you very much in every language possible. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Um, so again, as a reminder, you can put your questions for Linda into the Q&A and then I will moderate them. Um, and as people are thinking, I, I actually have a question. So this tracks um, similarly to my experience. So I'm the data librarian at my institution, but we have a separate business and economics librarian. Um, and so just anecdotally, do you have any thoughts on, on why that split in terms of you are getting the majority of the questions and the data librarian is not? Do they go directly to you or is it somehow shuffled your way some, some uh, other way? Um, do you want me to just stop sharing my screen and then we can see sure. each other? Yeah. So um, my sense is that, you know, students are coming to me for information that turns out to be data, right? They, you know, they're, they're an entrepreneur doing a feasibility study or a business plan and they need information. And a lot of it is statistical in nature. And so I, when I, when I spoke to students, I said, you know, come to me first. And then if it's something that um, I need to refer you to, I will, but um, I feel, I feel like I, I am the exception amongst my peers. And I don't necessarily know that um, senior admin uh, understands that 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 is what's happening. So, yeah, I think and that's and a common like problem. Today <laughs> I, had, I had four reference questions this morning in the email that were statistics, you know, so because we don't have a, a data librarian right now. We're in between yeah. people. And I'll echo what Bob is saying <laughs> in the chat is that subject knowledge is really key. Um, which is why having the liaison is so critical. And I would be lost for the economic data questions that I get without working closely with our economic and business librarian because it's all so hyper-specific, even the terminology, I wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah. Um, so interesting to hear about how it's going at another institution um, as well. So thank you so much. As we're going on, if you think of questions, you can put them into the Q&A box and we'll probably have a little bit of extra time at the end. So next up though, we have um, Jenny Morak, who's going to be our main presenter. And then we also have Christine Malinowski and Madeline Rabel who are gonna be on hand to answer questions during the Q&A. So Jenny is the GIS and data librarian at the MIT libraries and quick plug, co-chair of the ISS Geospatial Interest Group. <laughs> Um, she also provides general reference help, support for social science data, and is a liaison to the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. So along with Christine and Madeline, she is part of the Citation Management and Writing Tools team and Statistical Services team. Now, Christine is the Research Data Librarian at MIT Libraries, and then Madeline is with the MIT Libraries as well as the GIS Specialist. And so we've got three fantastic people here, and with that, I'm going to let Jenny take it away. Okay, thank you. So our presentation today is co-location and collaboration, how space influenced our library data services. Um, and as Stephanie mentioned, I'll be the main presenter just in the interest of time, but Madeline and Christine will be here um, to answer any questions during the Q&A. So the reason we're talking about this at all is that unlike some of our other library services, our new physical space is really the catalyst for the new services we started implementing um, you know, around data. And so that doesn't always happen um, that way in the library. And so I'm gonna be talking about the space, um, how its design led to increased collaboration um, among staff and new services. And we initially proposed this topic when the conference theme was data by design um, in Sweden. And so we were gonna showcase both the physical kind of design and the service design. And we have not been in our space since March, 2020. But I will talk about how space influenced our services prior to going remote. Um, we've also added a little section at the end about the virtual space. 
So existing services and spaces. My co-authors and I are part of the Department of Specialized Services within the MIT Libraries. And our department focuses on providing data and software oriented services across um, all departments at MIT. And prior to um, moving into our new space, staff were dispersed throughout the architecture and urban planning library um, and in other libraries across the campus. And the result was that our team was fairly siloed without much communication outside of departmental meetings. And the main services we had prior to creating this new physical space were our GIS services, data management services, and our citation management and writing tools service. The only physical space held by our department was the GIS lab. This was a small space, only had seven computers. There was little um, area for group work because the space was pretty small and also teaching in the space was limited as well. We also didn't have any points of service. Um, so with staff offices scattered throughout the library and across campus, Students could use the GIS space on their own, but were unlikely to be able to get help unless they scheduled an appointment or we were there for the designated drop in help. And the space was focused on GIS consultations. Um, so it wasn't apparent that data management services or citation management services even existed. During 2017 and 2018, we reconfigured the first floor of our um, architecture urban planning library that was formerly book stacks and microfiche readers. And the goal of the project included creating a space where GIS and data management services have a combined presence, increasing the size of the space, allowing for flexibility in the configuration, um, and increasing the visibility of staff to our community. And this was also meant to be an experimental space where the design and the services could be modified as needed. And so we opened the new space in September of 2018 and it ended up being a mix of staff offices, computer lab space and seating for individuals and groups. We also created an XR space and we had just begun exploring XR, te XR technologies and this was led by Madeline. And this really allowed the program to gain visibility and to expand. We also added places where students could work alone or in groups. And this was actually unique for our library because the main level of the library and the upper floors are completely open. And so they're more geared towards individual work. So just having this kind of more collaborative space in itself really attracted students who might not, might not otherwise have come into the library. Um, one of the more notable features of the new space was our much expanded and our rebranded GIS and data lab that had 16 computers, it had AV equipment and monitors so we can do some teaching in the space. And one of the more unique features is actually our staff cubicle offices were positioned throughout the space, making us more visible and accessible to our users. And so at first we were concerned about having our um, offices that don't have real walls within a public space and getting interrupted, but it actually ended up happening pretty infrequently. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So our new space greatly impacted our services going forward. Um, the new space really became a place to get centralized help. And so within months of opening, the GIS and data lab became a space where students felt comfortable coming with any questions related to data, digital resources, or software. And we haven't had reference desks in our libraries for some time now, I think probably 10 years. And so students often stopped by during um, designated drop in help hours to ask questions on a variety of specialized topics in addition to GIS and data management. Um, as I just said, we had formal and we had joint GIS and data management drop in hours. And we often referred users between these services, but also gave visibility to both these services as well. The closer proximity of staff offices to the user space further enabled users to interact with us as um, the experts. Users have been able to find staff if they have questions, and we would often informally check on students who are using computers or working kind of as we're coming and going out of the space. Um, and as I mentioned before, all of our teams included some staff who primarily report to other departments or have offices in other libraries. And so the staff, the lab became a space where they um, and, and other staff in the library could schedule consultations with, with users, which further increased staff visibility and collaboration among staff in our department. 
As I mentioned previously, uh, users stopped by to ask questions about topics that were not officially part of our service offerings, and that's really what led us to pilot some new services. And so previously, the only statistics help was available through a partnership we had with Harvard, um, and their data science services staff would provide help to MIT affiliates. And the services was more limited in that it was more geared towards research, research publications and often geared towards more experienced users. And while we were doing our joint drop-in hours, we found that students were stopping by the lab to ask pretty basic questions about statistical software as part of their introductory courses. And my co-authors and I had some experience with statistical software, and so we developed a pilot service aimed at those new users. Similarly, based on questions we received about data visualization, um, GIS and Data Lab staff, led by Christine, piloted two data preparation and visualization workshops in this space and also just expanded the general workshop offerings on this topic. There was increased visibility for existing services as well. Madeline collaborated with uh, one of the MIT labs to offer virtual reality workshops in this space uh, and also begin offering equipment loans and self-service documentation for using the XR space. We supported these new services by increasing software on our computers related to data analysis and visualization. So we installed things like Envivo, Gephi, OpenRefine, Stata. And with the rebranding of the space as the GIS and Data Lab, it became kind of a natural place for users to look for this type of software. And so we found that as students and faculty discovered the space, we began receiving requests to use it for class workshops in addition to the workshops that the library staff were teaching. And during the first year, we had 20 workshops in the space, and those included workshops taught by library staff, but also faculty and staff from other departments who reserved it for special workshops so they could use our computers and use the software that was on it. And that further increased visibility of our services, having students from classes come in, which was not possible before. So like most library services uh, that are new, we did an assessment. And we conducted a variety of surveys to learn more about the usage of the space and the opinions of it. And this involved kind of leaving out surveys and also staff walking around at different times to see who was using the space and how they were using it. So overall, the space received positive feedback from users as a place to work collaboratively at tables or computers. And not surprisingly, some of the drawbacks were things associated with having a fully open space, such as noise traveling back and forth and lack of privacy. The computer space layout, layout was set up well for both individual work and group work during instruction sessions. And this is something that other computer spaces the, the libraries have on campus didn't really um, provide. And so because it was not originally designed as an instruction space, we did have to work with what was there. So some of the drawbacks were pillars um, holding up the, the ceiling that obscured sight lines and some issues with noise traveling back and forth, but it was still a much preferable space for instruction, especially within data and software, um, as opposed to the other spaces available to us. And users liked the availability and visibility of the staff. And for us, these serendipitous encounters allowed us to learn more about user needs related to data services and led to all the additional you know, pilots and collaborations I mentioned. And so the results from this assessment were actually used for the renovation of our main library that is just wrapping up now, especially around um, space and just having staff space, student space, individual space, teaching space all in one. Uh, just to see how that worked. And so both kind of the positives and negatives were taken into consideration for that renovation. And many of the identified challenges that I just mentioned were actually um, addressed to some extent over the, in the last couple of years because this was seen as an experimental space. And so luckily our administration was willing to work with us and kind of continue to tweak the space over the course of the last couple of years. So now I'll talk about what happens um, when we started working remotely. And so like most libraries, we shifted to fully virtual services during March, 2020, and our library locations are currently closed. Um, but we continue to provide all of our services virtually, and that includes our workshops, access to our lab computers, and um, continuing consultations remotely. We've continued to expand our service offerings and our visibility, even though we you know, went virtual, including um, 
the ability to allow more people to attend our workshops because we were not constrained by the size of the space and the ability to reserve a lab computer for remote usage. And the remote computer usage has actually been incredibly popular as it allows students to complete work using software they can't install on their own machines or won't run officially on their own computers. And these are actually, um, they're able to log in directly to the remote computer. It's not any sort of like cloud or, or virtual service that way. And this type of service would have been difficult or impossible if we had not developed the more robust lab space prior to working virtual. And even though we don't have joint drop and help at the, at the moment, we're continuing to bring um, others from different groups in our department into our virtual consultations as needed. And we've been doing a weekly happy hour among the lab staff in order to maintain our informal collaborations. So even though we do not see each other in our cubicles every day, we get to see each other every week virtually that way. And having experience with in-person collaborations really led to an easier transition to virtual collaboration since we were already used to collaborating with each other during our consultations. And we further mirrored our centralized physical space by creating a centralized data services page on the library website, which didn't exist um, prior to this creation. And so finally, our community is now more comfortable with working in a virtual environment, environment. So we plan to continue some of the services that were influenced by our virtual space, such as our online workshops and our computer reservations. We may also pilot some online drop and help to mirror the in-person help we provided. And our physical space might be used in different ways as well once MIT returns to in-person lear learning and working. And we may develop new in-person services as well as the result um, of our virtual time. And so in conclusion, we began using this experimental space without knowing exactly what would happen in this space or how. We learned to be open to anything and to shift and pivot our ways of working as needed. The positive effects of the new space overshadowed the few negatives and led to new opportunities for collaborations and services to better meet the needs of our community. And our experimental mindset led to a fairly easy transition to virtual working, and we were able to continue and even expand upon our services in a virtual environment. And thank you, that's it. Thank you, Jenny. That was really interesting. We have a, you know, not quite similar, but data GIS lab thing as well. So super interesting to hear about how it's going in other libraries. Um, we do have a couple questions. So um, a really good question that I, I had a similar one when I was listening to you talk um, is, do you think it is the visibility or novelty or convenience that is drawing the students to this space? I think it, and my, my co-presenter, or my co-authors can also chime in, I think it's a combination of everything. We, in addition to just it being kind of like a, a novelty, we work with our marketing director to, to do a lot of branding. So like on the entrance floor to the library, they, they put like, um, what are they called? Like sticker things that says like new GIS and data lab, visit it with arrows and stuff. Yeah. So, like, so the visibility is definitely part of it as well. Um, I guess that's what I'll say on that. If anyone at Madeline or Christine, if you want to chime in, feel free. I was going to actually say, you know, the, the floor it's on is actually not the most visible in the libraries. Um, so the marketing was partially be like, hey, this exists. It's no longer bound journals. You should come check it out. Um, but I think, yeah, I think we, we sort of started to see a little bit of word of mouth of like, oh, there's a place that you can sit at tables and talk to people in this library. Because as Jenny mentioned, there aren't a lot of spaces in this particular library where that is doable without sort of everybody in the library hearing. So I think it became a space that people were like, oh, we can do group work here. And I think that brought a lot of people. And then I was like, oh, they're teaching. And so it's sort of just uh, snowballed a little bit that way. Okay, and then um, another question, we have time for another question before we move on, and a lot of people are interested in the remote access. Um, so I'm going to phrase this generally as if you could just talk a little bit more briefly about how you're going about providing remote access and any, again, quickly, any kind of like challenges or issues that you kind of ran into and how you managed to get that because not every institution was able to spin up remote access. 
Yeah, I thought that I thought that might hit a chord with a lot of us as data professionals. So we had actually, so we just did like remote desktop, and we actually had that set up prior to going remote, and we hadn't actually used like we weren't really using it like advertising to people, but it was on the computers. So we had our our IT kind of allow remote access. And so uh, without getting into too many logistics, we just do it that way. But we basically manually have people email us. We kind of book them for a certain computer. Um, and then they're able, we send them instructions and policies and stuff. They're able to log in. So it's fairly low tech as far as that goes. Um, the main issues have been, which hasn't happened as recently, sometimes the computers would stop working or like we couldn't access them remotely. But luckily, our IT, our IT staff were able to get access to the campus. And so they were actually great about going into the space within like 24 to 48 hours and like rebooting stuff or troubleshooting. Um, and so we worked through that and kind of came up with some policies for like restarting them periodically and to prevent that from happening. But that's the gist of it. But anyone, you know, can feel free to post on the website or follow up after if you want any more details. Thank you. Yeah, I'm starting to think we also did remote access and it looks like Harris in the chat is saying that they did as well. We should start a thread about the remote access and what didn't didn't work because we ended up using Google calendars. And let me tell you, that does not work well when you have 100 people to make reservations, but it worked well at the beginning. Um, so thank you. That was a really interesting um, presentation. So uh, thank you to um, all of you. So for our final presentation of the day, we have Alex Storer and Julie Williamson, and they're going to talk about um, the Research Hub. So Alex leads the data analytics and research computing team at um, Stanford Graduate School of Business. So he consults with researchers on challenges about data storage, cloud infrastructure, all manner of things. Um, and Julie is the assistant dean of the research hub. And I'm going to keep it brief because they are going to talk a little bit more about their roles as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Alex and Julie. Great, thank you. Is my screen visible? OK, excellent. All right, so, um, so yeah, diving into it. Uh, we're going to tell you today a little bit about um, what we do at the Research Hub, and specifically how we provide uh, cross-functional data services to researchers at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. So I'm Alex, I'm joined by Julie. We're both going to talk and kind of pass it back and forth. Um, yeah. So, uh, so when people think about the Graduate School of Business at Stanford, I think most of the time they don't think about research. I think the, the MBA program is much more widely known. But there is a, a very active research community at, uh, at the GSB. There are PhD students, there are a ton of faculty members, and many of these faculty members are very accomplished. So the 2020 Nobel laureates in economics, Robert Wilson and Paul Milgram, are both GSB faculty members. And the research that happens at the GSB is actually um, quite broad. So it spans a lot of the social sciences in addition to what you might expect at a business school, uh, like we've heard earlier in the session about uh, accounting and finance. So uh, a lot of the previous research that, um, that the GSB is known for is very theoretical. Um, so those Nobel laureates did, uh, did a lot of economic modeling, uh, but they didn't use a ton of data. And now we're seeing this major shift across the entire school where data is becoming absolutely crucial to refine and confirm those groundbreaking theories. And the data can come from so many different places. So um, the diversity of this data is really key. It could be historical data from um, books or other scanned records, it could be donated from a friendly company, it could be purchased from a data vendor or licensed from that vendor. Uh, our, our researchers also collect data experimentally at the behavioral lab. Um, and then finally, this data can be scraped from the internet, which is a less conventional uh, data source. But all of these together provide a set of challenges that we aim to meet at the research end. So take it away, Julie. Oh, and you are muted. Okay. So the Research Hub is a relatively new organization, and we are super excited to be more involved in IASIS. Um, 
So it's a unique multi-unit organization that provides research support services to Stanford's Graduate School of Business and the library services to the GSB and the broader Stanford community. It includes the uh, GSB Business Library, a data analytics and research computing team, which Alex oversees, and that's data, comma, analytics, comma, and research computing. We uh, lovingly call them DARK, and a human behavioral research lab and a convening programs and operations unit. So our organizational structure helps us take a holistic approach to our services. Uh, we consider the research process as a whole for every research project, data set, or question that comes to us. Let's jump to the next slide. So today we are going to discuss how the services of our DARK team intersect with the GSB Business Library Services to provide a richly interconnected data support program. We are able to provide end-to-end -end custom data services through interconnected roles, functions, and systems. The team includes research librarians, legal and acquisitions librarians, a data curation manager, and uh, note, we are hiring. So if you want to come and work with uh, fun and smart people uh, and live in sunny California, come and join us. Uh, we also have uh, data engineers, research computing specialists, and research analytics scientists. So these individuals self-organize to address the unique research uh, inquiry, storage, compute needs, and uh, for each data set and for each researcher. What you don't see pictured here uh, is Stanford Libraries. So I also work closely with Stanford Libraries this morning. We connected with Ashley Jester, many of you know Ashley, regarding a data security question about a data set she purchased that one of our doctoral students would like to use. So now let's talk about how these individuals work together when considering data sets in the research hub. Uh, so one of the first questions we ask when considering a data set is, is it useful for researchers? Uh, research librarians assist uh, researchers to ensure each data set is suitable for each research project. They help to identify relevant data sources and data providers for each research project and for classroom use. So this includes helping researchers discover existing library resources, as well as identifying and vetting new sources, comparing variables, date coverage, company coverage, and data collection methodologies. Approximately half of our research data is licensed from non-standard providers, or it's obtained by our DARK team by scraping or other methods. So librarians and uh, DARK team members regularly consult on these type of data acquisitions projects. So another question the team asks when considering a data set is, is this data set licensed for research? Librarians provide assistance for all aspects of data acquisition that support academic research from negotiating master data agreements to individual data use agreements to managing vendor payments to getting the appropriate final signatures from various Stanford offices. The library's data licensing team negotiates contracts with data providers, uh, such as ensuring appropriate publication rights and ensuring the GSB gets the best deal on pricing. Uh, data acquisition agreements can be quite complex. And this is a lot, this is where a lot of the magic happens. We have uh, uh, research and contract librarians working with data scientists and engineers to ensure each acquisition is in compliance with Stanford policies, including appropriate security and access controls. So during the contracting phase, contractual agreement support is tied to a foreseeable data use case, data storage, research computing, and security. The teams also coordinate on delivery and continue support on compliance issues for all aspects of data lifecycle management from onboarding to offboarding users, resolving issues with providers, and advising users on their rights and obligations. So it all ties back to the researchers' needs. Yeah, so speaking of the researchers' needs, 
ultimately, we have to ask if using a data set is even feasible, given what a researcher is hoping to do with it. And this is a really big and complicated kind of framework for questions that really ties in a lot of the research computing aspect of this. So if you think about uh, acquiring a data set, particularly a really large data set, often the platform where you're going to be doing that analysis is really important. So you might have to use a separate platform and it might be uh, not equipped with the software that you want to use, or maybe that you have to use to do your analysis. It might be stuck in a sandbox where you can't export all of the data out of that environment. Um, and it might be restricted in terms of what systems you can use it on at all. So on top of that, the data from a provider might not be in a very useful format, even if it's licensed for your use, even if the contents of the data are good. The formatting of the data can make a huge difference, particularly if it's a really big data set that spans a long period of time. After that, you might have to combine that data with other important data sets, which can uh, sometimes be prohibited by one or both of the licenses for those data sets. Plus, uh, researchers are frequently collaborating with people at other institutions, and that's something that's often called out in these license agreements as well. So I think uh, we've talked about this abstractly a lot, so let's dive into uh, some specific examples. So we'll kind of start at the end with the paper um, to show that it worked, I guess, and then go through some of the details of how we were able to get this data on board. So, uh, so this paper is about uh, using a donated data set of microtransactions to evaluate healthcare spending uh, as a result of being a part of a, um, an insurer in the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. So before, during, and after, how much did people spend on medical care? So it's an incredibly rich data set uh, that was multiple terabytes and it came with a lot of challenges that Julie's going to go into. Okay, so um, the initial acquisition of this data set, it, it came from a well-intentioned uh, professor who originally acquired this particular data set and he negotiated the license. So we inherited um, a poorly crafted agreement that required us to do a significant amount of extra due diligence. So the contract itself was so poor that the contracts librarian and the professor tried to renegotiate it with the company, but this was not possible. So then we took the agreement to University General Counsel and they advised us on some things that we could do to still continue to use these data. And then we brought in um, the senior dean over the research hub to consult with how we could best comply uh, in light of the terms and conditions. So the um, application for use, um, this led us to create an application process for these data. So those who want to use these data first need to discuss their project with a research librarian and the professor who originally acquired these data. And if this sounds like a good project, the next step is for the applicant to actually fill out an application and um, and this application is then sent to faculty who have used these data or are using these data to ensure it doesn't overlap with current research projects. And then finally, the SAD, the senior associate dean, uh, will sign off if, if everything looks good. Um, so for these data, the next steps for us is uh, tracking users and the contracts librarian will then uh, consult with the researcher and have them sign an internal data use agreement. Uh, and then after that, we send them to, a, uh, to one of our fabulous data engineers who has made these data available in a few different environments for various query use cases. Yeah, so these data are, um are pretty big. So we had to actually evaluate some new cloud platforms for this data, keeping in mind what the license agreements were for the data, as well as um, what the specific researcher use cases were. So as a result of this, we've actually iterated through several different platforms. And there are a few different places where you can work on the data, depending on what sort of cut you're interested in getting. So being able to work with the researchers on that helps us provide um, a holistic view of, of helping them achieve their goals. 
So another interesting uh, data set that we acquired um, was a private equity data set. And uh, these data were initially the basis of a research investigation by Professor Ilya Strobelayev. And he found with these data that the valuation methods for unicorn companies, uh, primarily the way they're doing this, primarily determining valuation based on the last terms of the last financing round and share values, the, this does not give an accurate reflection of a unicorn company's value when it IPOs. And the more than half are overvalued. So this has direct implications for employee shareholder stock ownership and can make it very difficult for employees to know the true value of their stock, which can often be a significant portion of their salary. So as we look at the matrix of uh, the self-organizing uh, teams who work um, with this data set, um, initially when we acquired these data, the primary researcher and research librarian determined the most reliable data provider for these types of data. So that was the first step. And then the research librarian worked with the data provider to explain academic research needs. Um, like we were saying, we work with some non-standard data providers and this particular data provider had never worked with academic researchers. So we determined the, the variables that we needed. Um, we couldn't afford everything that we could actually see on the platform. So we were getting a feed. We couldn't get everything we needed in the platform, but we still thought deeply about what variables we could get that would benefit the greatest number of researchers. So then it came to contracting and the contract librarian had to work with the data provider and create an academic use contract. Um, and we also, during this, partnered with the data uh, engineer and this person assisted with how the feed would be structured. So the storage location, update frequency, etc. cetera. Uh, for uh, new projects and uh, if we get folks who want to use these data, so when a new researcher comes and asks us uh, for these data, they consult with a research librarian and if the project is sound, they are required to sign an internal data use agreement with the contracts librarian. And then at that point, they are referred to a data engineer who assists with the particular access needs. And this is another one of those data sets where uh, the way the company provides the data is not the way the researchers are hoping to use it. So we need to not only um, provide access to the data, but actually restructure it and make sure that it's available both in the original data that was provided and with all of the continuous updates. So then we're able to collaborate with the researchers and um, make sure that they're able to perform the analyses that they need to do. Great, so thank you so much for uh, sticking around to the very end, um, listening to, to what we do at the Research Hub. And again, if this sounds like a uh, fun, challenging, interesting job for somebody that you know, uh, send them our way. We'd love to talk about data curation with them. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Alex and Julie. Um, so we do have a few minutes left. So a reminder that you can put your questions into the Q&A. Um, so those uh, big matrixes makes my eyes bleed and make me break out in hives just thinking about um, <laughs> tackling those. So fantastic job. I have a million questions and now I would love to see you know, uh, uh, you, the things that you wouldn't believe I've seen as like a birds of a feather for difficult data access questions, because I think we've all, um, you know, wondered what it takes to get access to data from some of these non-standard providers. And so seeing that, you know, the number of people involved is, is really helpful in terms of getting the sense of what it, what it takes. Um, so while people are thinking if they have a question, I have one. Um, I picked up on something small you said that I'm really curious about. You mentioned that you had the staff in the research hub that will actually scrape data. So um, 
I'm super curious if I heard that right. So if they will actually go out and scrape data, because we, we sometimes get requests from faculty as well. And we draw this line, at, like we can kind of teach you how to do it, but you have to go and do it. And also please read the terms of service and don't get us in trouble. So I'm super curious if you have that kind of web scrape as data access as part of the service, or if that was wishful thinking and mishearing on my part. <laughs> That's such a fantastic question. Uh, so we've we've kind of gone back and forth on um, kind of the acceptability of scraping, and I think that there's a lot of legal decisions that are still um, kind of forthcoming about how appropriate it is. So um, so in terms of the the best practice, which is one that we do um, fairly often, actually, is we will get permission from the company to to scrape their site. One of the nice things about being the Stanford Graduate School of Business is that there's a pretty rich alumni network. So often there's somebody in that alumni network who you can get in touch with and say, like, hey, are you able to provide us with this data? Like, can you give us a database dump of it? And the answer is always no. Um, but then sometimes the answer after that is, but you're welcome to scrape it. So once we get that OK, then we'll provide that, that technical assistance uh, or sometimes outsource it, depending. Thanks. And then That's just to be clear, yeah, yeah, maybe I'll just say just to be clear that this service is specifically for GSB faculty, and so it's pretty it's pretty unique that the school offers this, and you know has a team that supports this kind of work. That's amazing. I mean, I can only imagine that if yeah, it was wider, you would be inundated with requests to scrape. Um, I do think I've seen some, you know, business data that people want, and I kind of introduce them to some of the other tools and say, I hope you like pulling tables out of spreadsheets or PDFs um, and things like that. So that's um, really interesting. So kind of last call for questions from our wonderful attendees. You can also always um, put additional questions in Whova for the presenters or send them a message as well. Um, but I know that everyone has been really uh, good sports to sit on us, to sit with us on Zoom for quite a few hours. Um, so thank you all for a great session. I, I have so many um, thoughts. I, I have so many questions about, you know, following up with the MIT library folks and, and how you get people to come into your stuff because we have one, but nobody comes. Um, and it sounds like there's a lot of interest in remote access as well. So we can continue that conversation on Whova. And thank you, Alex and Julie, again, for that really um, enlightening and, you know, claps for the amazing amount of work that that is. <laughs> it's a lot going on. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to go ahead and, you know, stop the recording and then see you all tomorrow, whatever time of day that may be for you for this day two of our wonderful presentations. And in the meantime, feel free to use um, all the chat and community on Whova. And uh, thank you so much to all our panelists. <laughs>